Uh, it is now my great pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker for SAEM 2018, Dr. Gail D'Onofrio, who is professor and chair of the Department of Emergency Medicine at the Yale School of Medicine. Gail is internationally known for her work in screening emergency department patients for substance abuse, brief intervention, and referral to treatment, and is a mentor and funded scientist and great leader and colleague to us all. Please help me welcome Dr. Gail D'Onofrio. Good morning. Just give me one minute here. Okay, good morning. I am really um, honored to be here, and uh, I thank the committee and all of the members that were able to have me up here to talk to you today about the opiate crisis. But more importantly, I'm here to talk about how, as emergency physicians, really have emerged as innovators, policymakers, and quite truthfully, heroes. So my disclosures. I'm funded by resources. Um, in any event, I think we can't start talking about this crisis unless we really put a face on this disease and you actually get to see all of the lives that have been lost and continue to be lost. So I'm just going to show you a few of these. They're on many websites. Uh, families uh, can put their obituaries and thoughts about their loved ones up. They tend to be more white because it's biased in who, um, who actually puts these up on the internet. But this is Jesse McCauley, 24 years old from Rockland, Massachusetts. This is a particularly terrific mess because three of his brothers died of an overdose. Antonio Gibson, 35-year-old from Akron, Ohio. Laura Beth, 21 years, Freeman, Missouri. Max Slade, 25 years old from Albuquerque. And Gregory Zemp, 48 years old from Bothell, Washington. I could go on and on and on. This gives you somewhat of reflection really across the country. Every day, more than 115 people in the U.S. die after overdosing on opiates. From the National Survey on Drug Use and Health, the most recent one, there are 20 million Americans greater than the age of 12 years that have a substance use disorder. 2.1 million of them have an opiate use disorder and 3.3 million people report non-medical use of pain relievers in the past month. There's no better way to describe this to you or you to see this. If you have not already, it's on the CDC website. This goes through the years, and all you need to know is the more red, the worse it is, the more the death rate is per 100,000. This is the first um, year where this, they started it. So here we are in 1999, and you can see that the red is really in the um, Appalachian Valley and one county in New Mexico. As we go through the years, it gets red and more red until finally the last we have. Virtually all corners of the United States are impacted by the drug overdose issue. Now when we look at this, this is again tells us something about what's happened over the years. And we start really over here, and if you remember, historically, um, this really started by uh, pharmaceutical companies, but really was fueled by our overprescribing. Um, Oxycontin was patented in 1996. By 2000, there were over a billion dollars in sales. And the academic detailing was initiated for the very first time. Pharmacists went to doctors and actually began to tell them to use different medications. This continued on. As you can see, that blue line are the prescription drugs. And lots of things happened, as you know. Pain became the fifth vital sign. 2001, uh, the Joint Commission came out with standards for pain. 2006, CMS began to reimburse us for how well we did with patient satisfaction and pain protocols, and on and on and on. 
And so from virtually very little, a letter in the New England Journal, minuscule evidence, we began to prescribe more and more. In fact, we were told to say, if you have pain, I have more pain medicine than you have pain. That's what I was taught. So it was fueled actually by this. However, we continue to overprescribe. Diversion occurred, and we were off. However, lately, as you know, we've switched, and we now have gone to more synthetic uh, formulations, such as with fentanyl. And nearly half of all the opiate-related overdoses this year were related to fentanyl. I'm sure that you've seen this um, throughout. Many of you may not even test for fentanyl in your hospital. It took me two years to get it at Yale New Haven Hospital. This involves all populations, um, all sexes. Females are going up just as much as males, and all races, although we have heard, and it is mostly a, a white male disease. Unfortunately, blacks and those of Hispanic ethnicity are catching up. It involves all age groups, and all age groups are escalating. It's particularly worrisome, as you can see, from those 15 to 24 escalating, and so we need to start really young with prevention. But let's not forget the older population, because we're going up as well. And in fact, it's the first time in the last two years that we found a decrease in life expectancy, particularly for white males. So if you look at this slide here, you see all the 12 leading cause of deaths, and we've done very well in cardiovascular disease, very well in malignancies. However, um, when you look down there at the bottom under drug overdoses and drug deaths, the opiate deaths have contributed to 0.21 years of lost life of life expectancy. This caused a huge stir in the world, as you can imagine. Left or right, doesn't matter where you fit here. Bipartisan agreement. This year, $4.6 billion effort was released towards prevention, treatment, and law enforcement initiatives. This is a drop in the bucket, and we'll talk about this as we go through, but it is a start. So first, let's talk a little bit about the science of addiction. I don't have enough time to go into everything here, but I think it's important because as I travel across the U.S. and I talk to doctors in all different fields, I find out they know very little about addiction. It all starts here in putting this in as briefly as possible in the reward pathways in the limbic system. This is where nature has decided that we were going to do things that were motivating and behaviors that were essential to life, whether that's to eat with food, and for human survival, or whether it's sex, for propagation of the species, or whatever it is, it's essential. Drugs act no matter what drug that is, whether it's illicit drug, such as nicotine or alcohol, or in some cases marijuana now, or whether it's an illicit drug. They all work relatively the same way and a little different in the receptor sites. They're all mediated by dopamine. The drug is used. Dopamine was released, euphoria occurs. It's very, very powerful. As one uses more and more, one no longer gets that effect. One needs to take more just to feel kind of normal because that neural circuits become adaptable to the fact that there's been lots of drugs um, that are influencing it. Can you imagine something so powerful that you would do anything, whether that was destroying your family or causing your own death, that you would not stop to do it. All of these adaptations that the neuro, uh, neural circuitry does, which is really to reduce those receptor sites and reduce the amount of dopamine that is around, all have effects on the prefrontal cortex, which we know is our decision-making abilities and our judgment. So we no longer have that. All of those effects are decreased. This is a PET scan, and on the left you can see the amygdala and all of the limbic system here and what happens in any kind of drug that you want to talk about there on the left. Um, you can see a normal control and you can see loss of receptors that happen and loss of that dopamine action um, throughout all of these, including heroin. And as you, know, as you can expect, this 
parallels into how the brain will then um, no longer tell you not to do something. It's very persuasive and it really characterizes all of addiction and our loss of control. And no matter what, if we're going to jail, if it's catastrophic death, it will happen. This shows you this is a, uh, also a PET scan. It happens to be around cocaine, but it was the easiest one I could um, actually find that you could see here. But even after someone maybe went through detoxification and is no longer dependent on a drug, that one still has these circuitry that are still there, doesn't go away. And in here, you see that the amygdala will um, not light up if people with had cocaine dependence are shown in nature video. Nothing happens. But even after months and sometimes years of use, if they're shown anything to do with that particular drug, any kind of paraphernalia will increase flow to the amygdala and that area will light up. So regardless of whether people are, quote, detoxed or no longer dependent, they are always craving medicine and drugs. Thus, as we know, addiction is a chronic relapsing brain disease. It is not a moral failing. There was a, uh, a um, talk that Robert DuPont, who was, one of the, was the actual first director of NIDA, um, wants to um, relay to us in a meeting, and I think it's pretty potent, and I will talk about it right now, and it was a case where he's trying to tell us about addiction, and he says, imagine that you are in your car, and you're driving along, and a child runs in front of you, and you try with all your might to stop your car. And you know that if you can't stop that car, the child is gonna die. And you trying to will yourself, and you're thinking, I have to stop this car. But the brakes don't work. And if you understand that, you understand addiction. So why do some people form addictions? Because not everyone does. There is a relationship between chronic pain and opiate use disorder and experimentation and opiate use disorder. Over a million people in the US suffer from chronic pain, that's one in three. More than 40 million people describe severe pain every day, but not all of those become addicted. And those that use experimentally, not all of those will have an addiction disorder. It's really very complicated combination of behavioral, environmental, and biological factors that increase our vulnerability. Certainly age is one of those. The earlier you start drug use, the more vulnerable your brain is to get that addiction. And genetics, of course, account for quite a large amount of it. The DSM-5 criteria is built around this loss of control. And as you see here, depending on amount of symptoms that you have is where the severity lies. However, everyone who takes chronic opiates has tolerance and withdrawal, which does not define the disease of addiction. It's really that loss of control, as you can see as you run through these. So what does that normal person or that person who has and develops an addiction feel like? It's no longer just euphoria. Their entire day is up and down, and at most time they're taking so much that there's hardly any dopamine that's released, that they're feeling sick most of the day. And they develop these symptoms of withdrawal when the drug is not available. These are the people we see. These are the people we don't like. These are aggressive people. These are causing enormous amounts of problems in our ED and lined up. If we don't treat them effectively, they'll be there for hours. But if you treat them effectively and you offer a continual treatment, I'm telling you they can be in and out in a couple of hours max. So what are the effective treatments for opiate use disorder? We don't need to study this. This has been studied ad nauseum for what we have. And we actually have pretty effective treatments. Um, these treatments are generally that you'll see in the press are called MAT, Medication Assisted Treatments, because they were combined with counseling and behavioral therapies. Although there have been major cock and reviews that have shown that just the medication itself, even without any therapy, just does as good. We don't like to say this, medication for addiction treatment, because that would be like telling you someone has diabetes and I'm offering them insulin, and insulin is an assisted therapy. We obviously know that that's not true. 
We know that there are behavioral things we need to deal with, whether that is dietary stuff, whether that's eye care, foot care, whatever adherence to this medication regimen. It's the medication, though, that is treatment. But somehow, in addiction, we don't think about it that way. So many of us like to say, if you're going to use the MAT acronym, that's to talk about medication for addiction treatment. Those are methadone, buprenorphine, and I will touch on naltrexone. Methadone and buprenorphine are opiate agonists. These treatments are effective. There is not considered treatment is detoxification, abstinence-oriented therapy, mutual support groups, or obviously naloxone as, a, as an antagonist. And in fact, just detoxification our own is a death sentence. If you listen to parents of children who have died or loved ones who have died, you will see. They've all been to programs. Some families spend $30,000, $50,000 to go away. And they are detoxed off of these medications. If you understand, as we talked about the addiction cycle in science, that doesn't fix anything. That takes away a physical dependence for a short period of time. They will go out. They will, trust me, use again. They are now no longer tolerant, and they will die. So these medications, as we talked about, uh, methadone and buprenorphine are agonists and partial agonists. And as you can see, methadone is a full agonist. What that means is the more and more I give, the more intrinsic activity there is. Where buprenorphine is um, a medication that does have a threshold. Therefore, sometimes it's not as effective, and those using lots and lots of heroin and fentanyl may need to be switched to a methadone or a full agonist. But they work, and they are called opiate agonist treatments. Naloxone, obviously, is an antagonist, and as we'll talk about, um, Vivitrol or naltrexone is a, a, um, also an antagonist, and that blocks and has really no effect at the receptor sites. What does it feel like when someone's taking these opiate agonist treatments? It's like this. Instead of the ups and downs and instead of feeling not feeling sick, they sort of stabilize and have normal function or able to be normal functioning people in society. It is not simply replacing one drug for another. This is a medication that's prescribed under very strict control and a very tightly controlled amounts. What does opiate agonist treatment do for us? All of these things, and this has been clearly shown. Reduction in illicit substance use, less viral hepatitis transmission, HIV and IV drug use complications, reduction in risks of overdose and death, risky behaviors, legal consequences, more available time to have sustainable relationships, find gainful employment, and deal with other medical problems. I know it's hard for emergency practitioners because you only see the people that keep coming back. But if we can give you the feedback on the people that do great and all the people in the world who are in opiate agonist treatment, you wouldn't know that. I can guarantee you there are all people in your institutions and whatever that are on opiate agonists. So what is the evidence? As I said, it's, it's very strong and we don't need to repeat it again. These are the studies that everybody touts at all times. This is one of the initial ones that was done in France when uh, buprenorphine was first able to be um, distributed by physicians in around 2002. The, um, down 2000 is when Congress in the United States allowed it. And as you can see here, as you go up on using more and more opiate agonist treatment, that you um, have gone down in deaths. And this was one of the major reported studies. It was followed by one in Baltimore, which also shows you that as buprenorphine was initiated here in 2002 and more people were using it, a methadone also increased that the death rate went down in Baltimore. Okay. There was a large Cochrane review that looked at buprenorphine maintenance versus placebo or methadone maintenance for opiate use disorder. There were 31 trials here, almost 5,500 participants. Methadone and buprenorphine were equally found to be effective, and that is really at adequate dosing. The only time where buprenorphine was less is when people use small amounts, which were not, and I'll show you later, not really effective treatment. But if you took the right amount, there was decrease in opiate use, 
and there was retention and treatment. I can't stop but tell you, until I tell you just a sentence or two about naltrexone because this has been in the news. It's another alchemy story. Vivitrol is a long-acting injection. It requires that one be detoxed for seven to ten days before one uses it. There is obviously no abuse potential or diversion. It's a clear antagonist. It's pretty expensive. It's about $1,500 an injection. And different new research has come out recently. One, believe it or not, in JAMA Psychiatry, and one that was recently released in Lancet. These were methodologically flawed in the one in the JAMA Psychiatry one in that those people who took buprenorphine um, got very tiny, tiny doses that we know don't work. Um, and those that got Vivitrol obviously got Vivitrol. Those were, that were taking uh, buprenorphine had to come in every day. There was all kinds of a mess. They then said it was non-inferior. The next article that came out in The Lancet was actually a very well done study. It was a comparative effectiveness of extended release naltrexone versus buprenorphine naloxone for opiate relapse prevention. The problem was that um, the first page and the results section uh, was totally inaccurate. So what they found is that, of course, people don't want to take naltrexone. Uh, almost 30% of people did not even um, initiate the naltrexone because you have to obviously be in horrible withdrawal. You have to do all those things that we say we can't do, all those uh, sort of symptomatic treatment that doesn't work um, before you start it. And the relapse rates were much higher in the um, naltrexone group than in the buprenorphine group. Yet, they say in the, in the final conclusion that once initiated, both medications were equally safe and effective. That was totally untrue. They were not equally and effective. It's like saying, you know, if you are and someone told me this, it was very high up, um, in, uh, and I won't mention who it is right now, but in a, a institute, that's like saying, okay, you have two people, one's really rich, one's really poor, they go through life, they obviously have the experiences they have, they die, they're equal. All right, so this is not true. And, and what happened is that now Alchemies is going out and doing that academic detailing, and not only doing that, they're doing it to the public and everyone's thinking that this is true. There's new research, too, that's just been out in the last few months that show there's an association with more overdose deaths two months after people stop naltrexone. So this is a problem. It's not that naltrexone is not a great medication and it's used in our armamentarium, and it may be for somebody that's after release from prisons that sometimes people have been off for a long period of time, or maybe people have been on opiate agonists for years and they want to try to come off. It's better to try something to decrease that craving for a few months. So it is part of our armamentarium, but it's a small part. And, and hopefully people are recognizing that. The unfortunate part is because it's not an opiate, that the right would really like to use this as first-line treatment, and it's not. And we, as researchers, need to be careful of how we present our research. So after all that I told you, only one in five patients will get treatment, even we know that opiate agonist treatment is very effective. Even when we know that the directors of the NIH, whether it's from NIDA or the entire NIH Collins, uh, put out the role of science in addressing the opiate crisis and say that these medications are the current standard of care. However, we don't do it. We've created all kinds of barriers. These treatments have been endorsed by all of these different agencies and organizations. The uh, Surgeon General report that came out in 2016 told us that we need to attack this with the same skill and compassion of which we would treat any other disease, such as heart disease, diabetes, and cancer and buprenorphine should be available in EDs. Yet, less than one-third of addiction treatment programs, and these are those that, that take people with insurance, at least 50%, use MAT. We know even from this article that was done in MAT and opiate use before and after overdose in Medicaid population in Pennsylvania, these people here were all after before and after heroin, and these were before and after prescription opiates 
that it didn't matter. Patients continue to have high prescribing opiate use with only slight increases in MAT engagement. So this you can see, very, real, very small uptake. Even after we overdosed, you died. You come back, you still don't get treatment, and you still get more opiates. So what can we do and why the emergency department? Because that's where the patients come. And we know this. We know this ourselves. We see it every day. WW, uh, the MMWR just came out, told you that 30% increase in opiate visits. This was just reported in March of this year. And offering treatment will not increase those visits. They are already there. All right? And I can help you so they don't come back. So what role can we as emergency physicians play in this escalating epidemic? We can do a lot. We can help reduce the stigma. We can safely prescribe. We can do a lot for harm reduction. We can access MAT, initiate it, and refer. And we can do a lot of advocacy because there's lots of us, and we know how to do that. There are people all over the country who are leaders who are working on this. My greatest fear is I forgot somebody up here. There are a lot in the Northeast, so all their little pictures are up there. But there's so many of you who are doing this. The first thing we can do is reduce stigma, and this is one of the biggest reasons why people do not seek treatment, is because they are stigmatized by this disease. So we need to be very, very careful. This was written by Michael Bonicelli, who was the White House National Drug Control Policy before it's almost all blown up right now. But he really says here, and I'll read part of it, that the routine vocabulary of healthcare professionals and researchers frames illness and shapes medical judgment. When these terms then enter the public arena, they convey social norms and attitudes. So it's our duty to strive to use the right language to talk about and promote evidence-based treatments and to demonstrate respect for our patients. So words do matter, and I suggest to you that you avoid the ones on the left and you use the ones on the right. So instead of calling someone an addict, even though they may call themselves, you don't define them by the disease. They have an addiction disorder. There is no such thing, obviously, as an addicted baby, because I just told you it was all about loss of control, so that's probably impossible. This is a drug addiction. We don't have people with, um, hyper, you know, with hyperglycemia and urine, uh, sugar in the urine, and we don't say, oh, you got a dirty urine today. I'm really sorry about that. You're not getting any insulin more. We have negative urines and we have positive urines. We 10 times relapse, but we talk about return to use. We talk about treatment attempts. We talk about being in remission. So in terms of safe prescribing, we all know this, and I could go on and on, and there's many of you who, who are working on this, but the thing that we do know here is that one in three-year probabilities of continued opiate use among opiate-naive patients does increase with the amount of opiates that you get. So if you're here at three days, you're very less likely to be on an opiate more than um, for a short period of time and have a probably of one year use of less than 6%. If I give you seven days, you can see that it goes up to almost 16%. If I give you a 30-day script, it's up to 35%. So if we can just work on that and that's where that three-day rule comes from, it would be great. We have the prescription drug monitoring program. We all know that there may be issues with this. We all know that it's not a panacea of things. This just came out this past month. Um, it's probably not a good thing to think that we could decrease fatal overdoses, but it is a good thing to look for co-prescribing of benzodiazepines and, and just to be careful with those. You can, but you need to be careful if people are on an opiate agonist. And we need to know that there are some promising ways to refine our use of this. Um, and it's, it's not finished yet. Many of you are working on it. We have those of you who are working on harm reduction, on opiate um, and overdose education, and naloxone distribution. And we know that naloxone should really be everywhere. And I just give a shout out to Joan Papp, who's the founder and medical director of Project Dawn, and also Krista Bruckner, who is here from Indiana, who is the project director of planned outreach intervention, naloxone, and treatment. There are many of you who are doing this. And then there are options for ED providers. 
before 2002 and the data, which was the Drug Addiction Treatment Act came out, we were not allowed to do anything but refer. After that, we could initiate buprenorphine and refer. And I want to introduce you to all the forms of buprenorphine that are now out there. So probably Suboxone is the one that you know most that is in combination with naloxone for its diversion. Um, reduction, and Subutex, which is buprenorphine without the naloxone. There are more formulations coming out every day. Sublocade is a one-month um, injection, sub-Q injection. One needs to be on uh, buprenorphine for at least seven days uh, stability before one uses that. There are other things coming down the road from Brayburn that could be a seven-day that could be a seven-day uh, injection, which has more promising ideas for emergency medicine. And of course, there's the um, buprenorphine, which was this um, implant. Um, we found that that had a lot of problems with that, but most of the time is that our medical colleagues didn't want to go fishing around for it to get it out because there's a lot of skin that grows over it and it became a really difficult thing to do and except if you were an emergency physician or a surgeon, most people didn't want to deal with that. So this is again a PET scan and I just want to show you that as you give buprenorphine, you block those mu receptors. The more that you give, the more that you block. So you have to be careful that you're giving enough um, hard to give too much, but that you are giving enough, and if you are, then you will block those receptors and people will do relatively well. We now have the 72-hour rule that allows all of you to administer buprenorphine in the ED, and the person could come back for three days in a row and get more buprenorphine, or if you have a waiver, then you could write a script, which I'm hoping most of you will have by soon. Um, but this does allow you to administer buprenorphine um, in the ED. And it could allow you to bring them back. You don't, as one of my colleagues said, we have no problem bringing people back for rabies vaccine. How the last time you've seen a real case of rabies, right? But you have problems bringing people back for treatment for addiction. I'm sure by now you have all read the study that we did and, and my colleagues at Yale um, but we did show that if we were to initiate buprenorphine in the D, people were two times more likely to uh, be in a formal addiction program at 30 days and were much less likely to use um, illicit opiates. And um, our cost effectiveness showed that really at almost every willingness, dollar willingness to pay, that this was effective for our engagement and treatment and uh, free opiate days. So the latest research shows that we really should do something with all this research. So we are, um, at Yale we do on, have put research into practice and we are um, doing this in routine basis and I'm proud to say by July every single one of my attendings will have been wavered. At MGH every one of those um, physicians have been wavered and I'll show you some that's happening at Cooper Hospital as well. So this is going on across the world and hopefully you'll catch on. NIDA has funded us. Um, here are my colleagues who are doing implementation science throughout the country uh, from New York, John Hopkins, Ohio, and University of Washington who are working on implementation projects. A new trial network here has been done who are the scientists here are looking at the use of buprenorphine in low resource and high intensity ED. So this is going on. Uh, this was something that was written in the Mill Bank of 2017 by Joshua Sharpstein, who's at the Bloomberg School of Public Health. And he said that given the magnitude of the opiate crisis, with more than in this time was 28,000 deaths each year, and it's now rising, it's 40 some, but really this year it's probably gonna be 60 some thousand. Uh, that Yale study should have caused an earthquake. Instead, it barely, regs barely registered a tremor. However, I'm here to tell you that the earthquake is happening, all right? And we have these fabulous heroes throughout the United States who have not just done research like myself, but have actually done this in the real world and have been um, really very innovative in how they've attacked this problem and we're going to see a little bit about them and I'm going to start with Dr. Hearing who's from Highland and hopefully I can get this to go. I 
I started out in emergency medicine, and that's where I remain, and that's where my heart is. Self-referral defines what I treat. So if you walk in with heart attack, I learn how to take care of heart attacks. If you walk in with, you know, arthritis, I learn how to take care of arthritis. The emergence of the opioid epidemic drove this problem into the emergency department. Here in Oakland, we've had a population of folks who started using heroin um, in the 60s, a population of injection drug using patients um, who come into the ER. We see such a broad diversity of pain and addiction, I was spurred to learn more about those things. So now I'm board certified in addiction medicine as well and going to take my boards in pain medicine. What can I do to take an individual just to make them one objective notch less in harm's way? The first step is just to treat the withdrawal. The ED Bridge Emergency Buprenorphine Treatment Project is there for people who come into the emergency department. They see our sign. They can be open about their struggles. And we can initiate buprenorphine treatment for opiate use disorders right then and there and connect them to long-term treatment. Hi, sir. The vast majority of our patients are treated just like this, sitting in a chair. We do the physical exam where you are trying to quantify how much withdrawal is going on. And we initiate the medication. That's it. And then we observe. The vast majority of folks will feel within 20 minutes much, much better. That's when you can have a a collaborative, transparent discussion about, okay, where do we want to go from here? When we started this project, we were seeing one, maybe two patients a week. Now we're seeing one or two patients per day. We have a grant from the state of California to expand this model to the whole state. We're not there yet, but we're committed to getting there. My message is that the individual physician, you do not need to become addiction boarded you don't need to understand every aspect of long-term treatment. We have a chance to drastically alter the trajectory of this epidemic, which right now is going in the wrong direction. My greatest goal would be to have someone go from being homeless, using unclean needles, and shooting heroin to completely stable on buprenorphine. There are clearly some patients for whom this medicine is as close as we have to a cure. Okay, give me one second. I'm having a little difficulty here. It's fine. Here we go to Rachel Harrog. She is from Cooper. So like the rest of the nation, this opioid epidemic is hit pretty hard in Camden County. And Cooper Hospital, as the only tertiary care and level one trauma center in the region, has really been the epicenter for patient care. We had one patient who had 173 Narcan reversals in one year. That's a visit every other day. The tendency in this country has been to treat patients with opioid use disorder uh, with, by sending them to rehab. And what we know is that this doesn't work. These treatments are not successful. What we do know is that we have evidence-based treatment. And this evidence-based treatment is medication-assisted treatment. By that, I mean buprenorphine, methadone, and Vivitrol. When we started looking around, uh, what we saw, like much of the rest of the nation, is that we have a lack of MAT providers for patients with Medicaid. And so what we had to do is we had to build our own. About two and a half years ago, we opened our clinic, call it the Outreach Clinic. It's very unique. Uh, it's interdisciplinary. We currently have four physicians, as well as an addiction psychiatrist. On top of that, we have behavioral therapy and quite a bit of support staff. We have a dedicated program for pregnant and postpartum women. We co-locate with the HIV uh, clinic, um, and we also offer group therapy, individual therapy, as well as family therapy. These patients who come to us with opioid use disorder and overdoses are difficult to deal with in the emergency department. In order to treat them in an evidence-based way, we had to change the culture in the emergency department. We had to adopt medication-assisted treatment as the first-line treatment for these patients. 
there are a couple steps that we had to go through. The first part, and probably the most important, was to get our physicians X waiver. Our physicians uh, moving forward were then able to prescribe buprenorphine. The second step addresses the way that we treat withdrawal. In the past, we have treated withdrawal with a cocktail of different medications, but the truth is that withdrawal should and is now treated with buprenorphine in our emergency department. The physicians then identified willing patients who were ready and willing to start treatment at our clinic. They gave them a limited supply prescription for buprenorphine, which was then refilled at our clinic. So by having this program, what we're doing is we're giving them these limited prescriptions, which incentivizes them to follow up with the clinic. It provides them with this evidence-based care, and then we take this care out of the emergency department and into an outpatient setting where it belongs. Okay, and last but not least, we move on more east. Dr. Ross Sullivan. Whoops, whoops, whoops. I can do this. From upstate My name is Ross SUNY. Sullivan. I'm an emergency physician in Syracuse, New York at the SUNY Upstate Emergency Department. And I'm also the director of the SUNY Upstate Opioid Bridge Clinic. This hospital, we see over 100,000 people in the ER. And the number of patients we've seen in our ER due to opioid related uh, problems have doubled really in the past five years. Couple that with a rate of in 2016, about 200 people dead in our county. And what I realized was that what we were doing was not working. There had to be a different way to help these people to make them safer, to make them healthier. And what we're doing now is we've started a comprehensive program, a clinic, a bridge clinic. So what we do in the bridge clinic is that we bridge that gap. Patients who come into our emergency department, particularly after an opioid overdose or a withdrawal, we give them a dose of buprenorphine. They get a single dose in the ER, and then within three to five days, they follow up in a clinic that we've established. And there they see myself and actually a peer. And a peer is a, a peer specialist. These are people who are also many years in recovery themselves, but are also specialists in social sciences. They might be social workers, they might be case managers. And together, we also help plug the people into the social services they need, whether it's helping them get housing, whether it's getting them insurance, food stamps if they need it. These things all have to also happen at the same time before we can even think about them doing all the work they need to do um, to try to conquer their drug addiction. We are now seeing about 60 patients a month. We've seen now in the two years over 300 patients. Those are people who would not have gotten help. Those are people who would not be in treatment. Of the people who come to our clinic, about 80% of them we successfully link to treatment. We actually decrease emergency room visits by about 40 to 50%. On one month follow-up, about 75 to 80% of them are successfully still there one month later, now getting buprenorphine or methadone or some other type of treatment. I started here four months ago, so about three months I haven't touched opiates since I started here. I mean, I've been to five, six different rehabs and none of them worked. Inpatient rehabs, long-term and short-term, and all of it worked very helpful for me because before I came here, I was an opiate addict. And since I've been here, I've been off of opiates, more focused on my treatment, set of my next fix. The most rewarding thing about this work really is, you know, when a patient really thanks you and, you know, they can look you in the eyes and tell you about you know, how their life has changed. I know it's kind of cliche. We talk about that a lot in emergency medicine, um, but our job is, you know, people in, people out. We get by by assuming and hoping that everybody does well. But to really see the fruits of your labor, to really see somebody be a productive member of society um, is the most rewarding thing that I've ever experienced. Okay, I'm gonna just finish up if I can do this. Okay, so what's the future? There's lots of things then you can do. Recently, I told you just earlier that we had set aside uh, four billion. Um, our friends from Brandeis have told us that if we want to continue this along with what's happening with the what's happened in the past with the HIV um, explosion of deaths, we have reached that and are exceeding it now. We need six billion dollars a year for ten years in us for order to tackle this, to build this network of doctors and treatment. 
we need to re stop restricting access to buprenorphine, and we are very much trying to get rid of the waiver. It's not going to happen anytime soon, so we have to suck it up. We have state initiatives that are being done in Connecticut and, I realize, and in Rhode Island, and we have lots of people working on that. We have quality improvement measures that are being done with our folks here at Yale and at Harvard. And uh, we have Dr. T uh, Ted Melnick, who is now doing an embed trial um, to look at an, a new IT approach to being able to get everyone to do this in a very quick way um, with one click, as I am told. We have a new um, discipline, addiction medicine. For those of you who don't know, it's a specialty, multi-specialty, with the primary board being preventative medicine. And we can bring that into EM. There's a practice track, just like emergency medicine. You've got four years to go that you can sit for the exam if you have enough experience um, in practice. If not, it will be one year fellowship after emergency medicine. We have multiple resources we're doing with NIDA, and we'll be able to share these with you and hopefully this whole presentation as we go forward by giving you algorithms and giving you um, DSM criteria and opiate withdrawal scales and whatever else that you need, we will do it. So we do have a huge opportunity now. It starts with you. Embrace science-based treatments. Engage emergency physicians and change the trajectory of the opiate ep epidemic. These are all these people, and I'm sure there are many more across the country who are doing this. So let's change the way we think about addiction, the way we talk about addiction, and the way we treat addiction. Thank you. Thank you for a wonderful address, so inspiring. Uh, are there questions for Dr. Donofrio? Yes. You'll have it, okay? So it's, um, as all things happen, uh, NIDA is create helping us. We've created this thing. It's going to go in the NIDA. We're hoping it's going on ASAP. It's got videos. It's got algorithms. It's got how you send someone home. You one click on each thing, download anything you want. And we do have videos that are available there on the Aetna website who's helped us film them. It's our content. Um, this hopefully will be up within, I was hoping it was up six months ago, but it's a lot of politics, right? So it will hopefully be up in the next month or two, but if you email me, I'll send you all the components of it really right now, anytime. Just like we have um, in other areas, they've had uh, people who are available to talk to people who want to create a program like this. There's many of us out there that you can do it, and by the way, Glad I just did that. So near the question that um, I need to thank all these people and and Dr. <laughs> Dr. Andrew is here, Herring and Dr. Uh, Ross Selvin are here. Could you stand up because and Rachel is not here, Dr. Herring, but I really wanted to thank them. I almost forgot that. I almost forgot that. I almost forgot that. And these truly are the real heroes. They've taken stuff and they are doing it in practice and they're innovative as all emergency physicians are. You find a problem, you don't know how to do it. And Dr. Herrick, who's not here, called me in once and said, teach me how to do this. These are toxicologists who are great. I need to do this. Um, tell me how much I should give. And she started this whole program on her own. And, and I just can't um, thank you enough for the field and for all of our patients, really. Thank you so much.